Hello and welcome to the show with me, Gillian Gott. So today my guest is Dan Sutherland, who is the founder of The Self Group. Dan, welcome to the show. Thank you. Very good to be here. Brilliant. So um, I want to talk to you about self. But before I get on, on to that, tell me a little bit about your background. You've got quite a strong, you're a very uh, IT background. Very, you, you worked in IT and worked for the one company which you sold off, I understand, in 2016. So very strong background in software. Perhaps you tell me a bit about it. Yeah, I've worked in tech for, uh, I guess, the best part of 25 years. Um, uh, no particularly auspicious starts, but um, I, I set up a, a managed hosting company in or about 2001, um, and uh, we got ourselves into uh, cloud computing very, very early. So sort of um, around 2005, 2006, um, uh, we, we managed to get eBay as a customer and... Um, uh, and and you know, I've always been really interested in the points in technology where um, where people iterate brilliantly on um, on on a particular feature and they make things you know exponentially better. And some things just get ignored, and people just do the same thing repetitively for a very long period of time. And uh, and we were looking at this data center full of computers and thinking these these are these things are. You know, these things are using up a vast quantity of energy and doing absolutely nothing. So we, we talked to the customer and we said, look, if we could just take all the workloads and just concentrate them as efficiently as possible on these machines, we'd you'd have a much cheaper proposition and it would work better for us and the whole thing would be more efficient and it would be a lot greener. Wouldn't that be great? And they luckily kind of ran with that and and, and thought it was really interesting. So um, we we pivoted our business at that point from a managed hosting business into a very early cloud business. Um, and, uh, and then I ran that for um, another, oh, uh, I guess 11 years before selling it to a company called six degrees uh, in about 2016. Um, so you're, and, you're, uh, you're ahead of the curve in terms of uh, adoption of new technologies. You, you see opportunities. Uh, I try to, yeah. I think I find that interesting, um, and uh, and and so uh, it's um, it's it's always interesting to be doing something that's relatively cutting edge because uh, the challenges are more profound and more pronounced um, than, than than they are later. I think that's the sort of entrepreneurial mindset. You know, you you go and tackle a go and tackle a big challenge, which is what we've tried to do with self. Yeah, so cool. So tell me then, also then, in conjunction, you like you you're, you're an early adopter of new technologies. So with blockchain, when did that come into your world, and and what did you think of it initially? Um, well, actually, blockchain first came into my world through a school friend whose younger brother had, uh, who was a very very early, um, who's very very early in uh, into Bitcoin. Uh, not because um not because he had been uh looking to invest in bitcoin because he was a photographer and he took some pictures for a startup company in canada who um offered to pay him uh, half of the fee for taking the photographs in this bitcoin stuff that they had and um and he he uh, he said all right yeah i'll take half of it in bitcoin uh, it turned out to be quite a good decision for him so he was he was pretty keen that people should get involved in this thing and i ignored him for a long while and said oh yes it was sure it's nonsense uh, and then I think about sort of 2015, I started paying a bit more attention and, and, and doing a few things. So I've I've um, I've had some swings and roundabouts with investing in crypto myself, um, as I think we all have. Um, uh, the financial side of it's you know interesting as it always is at the beginning of a market. It's a bit like a gold rush, but um, uh, the long term prospects for it I think are much more important than either wild swings in market valuations or monkeys. Yeah, well, I, th I think also because as as you're a, a software guy and a tech guy, so I mean, not many of us are, are born day traders or investment gurus or anything like that. So even though we're in this industry where there is an opportunity to make money, obviously in that side of things, but I think the more interesting side of things is how the technology is used. And um, yeah. tell me a bit about so is, is that did blockchain come first or the self group come first? How do how do they sort of come together? Well, so the idea for self definitely predated us using blockchain as a part of our proposition um we we started out actually thinking about um thinking about a few quite sort of fundamental moving parts so the first was um in real life i know i know who i am and the people who know me know who i am and uh, you know i can 
I can go and say hello to them and they'll say hello to me. And we, we build this natural human trust in each other, um, you know, from, from all kinds of unknown cues as well as from real things. Um, you know, some people you just get a feeling about, you're not quite sure about those ones. And you can do that in person, but that's very different in an electronic world. Um, so, so we had this, we had this, well, how do we take the kind of human trust that led to, and it leads to lots of real world things, that human trust, you know, the, the old days when, you know, the greengrocer on the street, on the corner of the street gave you credit until Friday when it was payday and then you paid the bill, you know, and he trusted that you do that because you did it every week. Well, that works really well in an electronic world if the trust can be there. So, um, so we wanted to see how we could take those kind of human concepts of trust and do something interesting with them in an, in an online world. And we also wanted to know how, instead of having, you know, a thousand different electronic versions of you that are slightly wonky in a thousand different databases across the internet, what if you could have just, just one definitely you that you could control and it would be the thing that represented you online, you know, an electronic self. Um, and so that that kind of core idea was quite important, but it led us to thinking about something else, which was to think about how um, how we have all become used to storing data. And this ties back to what I was saying about cloud computing previously, which is which is that um, we've made massive changes in the time since you know Alan Turing was first doing computing things with with his bomb uh, in how fast we can process information. Uh, billions and billions of times faster than, than he was able to do. But essentially, he was processing information that was stored in an early electronic version of a card index. And today's databases are still really a card index. They're not anything particularly different. The concept of them is really simple. Get a whole bunch of information, pour it in at the top, sort it out, and then ask it questions quickly to try and get information from it. And we thought, and there was a little we had a little bit of a kind of what would Alan do conversation um and and it was a and it was really well if if he was here now he'd have super fast con internet connectivity to do lots of things and he probably wouldn't move all the information into a central point and then quiz it he'd leave the information where it was and ask for it when he needed it and that got us thinking that all of us have these little supercomputers in our pockets and why don't why doesn't the information that relates to me sit on that device and the information that relates to you sit on your device it's in your hand you know it's safe it's in under your control mm -hmm. um and and then you know the the storage that the companies we work with and the people we deal with and so on use that wow. pertains to us is this storage but then there's enough connectivity to be able to speak to that storage when you need to because these pieces of data are tiny um and that opens up lots of possibilities blockchain really became part of this to kind of roll it back to your original question um uh, because um we got into the beginning of the pandemic and we've been building a quite sort of traditional services business around these original concepts um and you know i've been doing some crypto investing i knew a bit about crypto and we were using I know, the, I know people who are actual cryptographers hate the term crypto because it doesn't really relate to the to that. We use a lot of cryptography inside itself. Um, and there's a lot of encryption of things. There's a lot of fairly complex cryptography used, lots of keys and chains and all sorts of stuff. Um, and um, we started, we, we'd used, uh, we'd used uh, Hyperledger as a, um, uh, as a, as a, uh, a distributed ledger just to store certain things in it. It was quite useful. Uh, when when the, when the pandemic started, um, we had a quite difficult decision to take. So self, um, I have a small investment fund that I use to fund things that I build. And I'd been using that to fund the um, fund the, the development of self. And we sort of, we looked at it and we said, well, I've got these 15 guys working for us. Um, and, you know, we really don't know what the world looks like right now. It could go in any direction. You know, early 2020, we had no idea what was happening. And I and I, some of the, some of the people who work with me now have worked with me since the early days of Carenza, so uh, which was the the cloud business. So you know they've they've been with me for 15, 20 years. Been through all so that web two stuff. Enough. Sorry. They've been through all that web two stuff. They've been through all the web two stuff. Yeah, they've been they, they started out with the with the, with the uh, you know with the web um, and and then went through web two and, and and now here we are. But I, I didn't feel we could, you know, 
mothball the thing and close it down and make everybody redundant because we didn't know what the future looked like. So we decided just to change the the way we were looking at things. And we we turned ourselves really into a an R&D team. Um, and we reduced our costs as much as we could because we didn't know what the world was going to look like. And we said, okay, well, let's, let's relook at everything we've done and let's look at the things that are out there and the possibilities. We don't know what the end game is for what we're doing now. Let's look at what's actually possible. Mm. And we started to look at the, and that gave us the time and the freedom to kind of be much more expansive in the way we thought about the project we were building. Um, and one of the things that that led to was, was realizing firstly that, the network at the heart of self was much more interesting if it was a decentralized network with the nodes distributed out to as many people as possible. Um, we used at that point, we were thinking of, do you know, a project called Theta. Um, um, so, so Theta is a distributed video platform that's used by kind of big, you know, it's Sony used it for the PlayStation network and, and so on and so forth. And it's it's a way of distributing video out to 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 users very quickly using a using a web three network. Um, so we um, we realized that by by having a decentralized network in the core of this, and by having a roadmap that took us to the point where the network was uh, user owned and controlled by a DAO, um, that would allow the functionality within the network to be much broader than was possible with a corporation. You know, we were talking here about a system that would allow everybody to identify themselves to each other and communicate with each other and do things. And we felt that if that was, if that was anywhere near as successful as we wanted it to be, the, um, the regulatory challenges we would have as a corporation holding that information would be really painful. Um, and also it would probably be inappropriate for it to be inside a traditional corporation because uh, the, you know, because the possibility of it being bought and taken over by a bad actor who thought this is nice data. Thank you very much. Would GDPR, would, would GDPR have impacted your decision making as well? Not really, no, because we were never in a position where there was any data in the core of self. So, okay. Everything in data, everything in self is held on the phones. So, um, so self, self as a company, as an organisation, doesn't hold user data. So you're non custodial going, for the data. We're not, we're not uncustodial for the data and yeah. for anything else. Yeah. Um, we, we, we kind of, this is, this is about a tool that lets people identify themselves and do things with their data because personal data is just that, right? It's mm. theirs. They should be free to do stuff with it we, we what we've built is a means for them to securely share that between themselves um with with the knowledge that the things that are going from end to end are, are, are safe and that they can trust the party at the opposite end but it's not about using and selling and sharing their data I, for me personal data and identity and things like those aren't products to me and they are to many people but i don't believe they're products i think I think selling identity is a little bit like selling air. You know, I, I am just me. And I, I, it kind of offends me when somebody tells me my identity is expired and I need to renew it. And I'm still here. Yeah. And the idea that a passport with my picture in it and my date of birth in it is invalid because the date's changed. It was valid yesterday and I'm still here. So it's that That's kind of approach. That's point. That's a really, I had not considered that before. We used to do it. We blindly do these things because yeah. that's the way they're done. We do, Yeah. And um, and so um, and so we we started thinking about the business from from that perspective. So what could we do with something decentralized? And it made sense at that point that we would go down the road of funding this decentralized DAO with a with a um, with a token. Um, but that there were things about the project that we created that were definitely more in the traditional business vein. So um, you know there were some B two B services there that actually were much more appropriate as a you know service that was paid for so the ability for example that we have for businesses to make phone calls using self um and essentially know with certainty so know with certainty that the recipient of the call is the right human um but also for the recipient of the call because currently almost every bit of authentication you will have to go through is asymmetric you know you have to prove who you are but the company just says to that. so we wanted to make that process symmetrical so that the user knows it's the bank calling and the bank knows it's the user clever that they speak clever to. again you're thinking um differently aren't you i, uh, I think so mm. i think so 
I think so. I, a, a couple of us are quite dyslexic, and I, I, I'm a big believer in the power of sort of dyslexic thinking to look around corners and see. Yeah, things and neurodiversity you become. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So, um, so, so, yeah. Self, self's kind of journey into crypto was was actually this is the right. This is the interesting technology for us to use, um, and also it was, it was a feeling that behind all of the kind of early stage froth of, of the crypto world, there was real utility to come out of the technology that wasn't about it wasn't about it being money necessarily, but about it being an opportunity to look at commercial relationships and commercial to user relationships in a very different way and to secure those relationships in a very different way. And I think and we're we're we're, we're we're doing these kind of processes. We're at the beginning of this launch process now. You know, there's the stuff that we're sort of saying we're doing this at the beginning of the launch, but there's so much more stuff that we're incredibly excited about being able to do in the future. And actually, once we can start to push this out to a community, get other people to start doing, that becomes fascinating. Um, and um, and so it's it's a I think it's the beginning of a really interesting journey that we're that we're on right now. Like from what you're saying, then would self be like a, a world domination play almost? So this is like everywhere. I get all very itchy when people use those terms because it makes me scared. But uh, but yeah, I'd like it to be. I mean, it, listen, it's you, you, a it's a free app. app. It's a better word. Yeah, yeah sorry. it's a it's a it's a free um, it's a free tool from a consumer's perspective that lets them verify the information about them and use it. And even if they just use it because they want to be able to uh, talk to their friends, knowing that the communication that they've got between them is between the two people they think it's between, or, or you know, um, uh, so shortly we'll be able to allow kids to have a self count and um, for the authority to do things within self to be delegated to the children by the parents so they can do certain things. So like kids, my, my children are 11 and eight, you know, so that they can, I, I would like my daughter to be able to chat online with her classmates, but I'd like it to be able to be done in a walled garden that doesn't feel like a walled garden to her with her parents kind of overlooking what they're saying. Mm -hmm. But to me, I know that there are some restrictions on who she can talk to right, right now. She wants to be able to sort of message with all sorts of people and, and, you know, it's all very exciting for them. And I, and I, I'd like them to be able to have the excitement and the power to use technology and the power to kind of expand their, their you know, their worldview through it, um, but without the risk. And um, and so we're, we're we're really keen on it being an enabling technology from that point of view, because, you know, I, the Internet really should be what I think we were all told it was going to be when we were younger. You know, this amazing new world and it was going to be brilliant. It's going to be fantastic. And it took a very short amount of time before it was there be dragons. Um, and uh, the kids should have the the wonder of going, wow, look what I can do yeah. without the, without the threat. Um, and you know, well, that's a very real issue. Isn't the, it? Parents, it's a huge issue. Yeah. parents are told all the time to be savvy. But it's very hard to be savvy when you are 30 years older than your kids or whatever, you know, the gap is. And they're yes. digital natives. And it's very difficult to ask a, that that 30 year gap to try and catch up yeah. with your kids. You know, it's um, yeah. it's yeah, I, I, I feel bad when I hear all these programs saying parents now you must learn to become you know savvy. Going, How can they possibly beat the kids? <laughs> you know? Yes, exactly. This is something yeah. that would come uh, uh, the, the child protection element. And how would so then yeah. you set up a, so how do you stop them going to other places where they're not meant to be? How do you create that wall garden? That's, you know, a nice wall garden, if you like. So, um, so, so we, we can only control our own environment. So we can give them the ability to talk to each other within that environment. We can't stop them going and downloading other apps other than unfortunately through the parental controls that you just talked about, you know, where you've mm -hmm. got to beat the kids, but kids, what they actually want to do is talk to each other. They kind of don't really, and they want to do they want to do it in privacy because they feel like they're growing up and they really deserve to be this new grown up person. Um, and if you give them the ability to do the things they want to do, from from watching my kids play with the with the um, prototypes of this, they don't go and look for other things to do as well because the 
um, you know, the endorphin rush for them is that suddenly they can message their friend and all they're doing is sending them a cat emoji, but, mm. but it's great for them. It's awesome. You know, or they're, or they're searching things on the internet and sharing them with each other, which is great. Um, it's just the things that they're stopped from doing are the things that probably they didn't really want to do anyway, but they, they just can't get pushed in that direction. It, it takes, it takes real, um, breadth of adoption before we can start affecting other mm. things um so um but so you know to give you an example of what one of the things we're doing there we're, we're building uh we're just building the ability at the moment to uh, allow people to gate a group inside telegram based on self-membership so if you've got a self-account you can use your self-account to auth into your telegram into a telegram group and we can as a result kind of we can gate who is in a telegram group down to yes they're a real human and you know no they're not on a list of people that we don't want on that group or any of those kind of things so you can suddenly kind of remove a lot of the the noise from a telegram group and make it more useful so those kind of interactions are really are really powerful but as, as a project that is gradually being entirely open sourced um it's also open to the community to build integrations that that, that help them because those integrations are essentially about leveraging the ability to use verified identities to do things and it's probably important to say there um these identities are designed really to be used anonymously so we are trying our primary objective from our users point of view is to identify a specific human and say this specific human is the right specific human but we don't want there to be any characteristics with, with that human unless the human would like to share them. Selective disclosure element. Very selective disclosure, yeah. So you know, actually, if I'm buying a pair of sneakers online, I I um I want to go and buy that pair of sneakers, but I don't want to be able to, I don't want to have to tell them my name or my address. I don't really want to give them my bank details. Um, and I, I don't want to have to provide them with um, my email address or my postal, any of that stuff. I want to say I want the blue ones and here's the method of payment and uh, send them to me. So um, and one of the things that, that people can do with self is use it as a, you know, they can use it as an address. So um, uh, we want, um, uh, we're, we're talking to uh, a couple of delivery companies as, as a kind of prototype project at the moment about them being able to, not use a postal address as a means of delivering things but actually for the for the organization doing the shipping to ship to to ship to a self identifier a self id um to, and so when it's gone to one of the one of our ids the user can then determine where that package is getting delivered to um and the package is then delivered to somewhere the the shipping company hasn't the company delivering it has no idea where they've sent the product the parcel to only the courier knows where they've sent the parcel to but the courier doesn't know what's in the parcel it's a sort of you know, you, you you create some separation there between between things where the data doesn't really need to pass. And if I'm at my house one day and I've ordered a pair of jeans and I need them and I'm going to be in a hotel instead the next day, well, I'll just divert the parcel to the hotel and have it delivered to me at the hotel to to, to pick up there. Um, at the moment, that's a difficult thing to do. But actually, if you're if you're addressing, if you're making the person personally addressable um, where they physically happen to be, that becomes quite an interesting interesting way of doing things. That would be handy. It's like also that whole idea of like what you want to disclose. Like if you want to buy, if you're an adult and you want to buy alcohol, you don't want to tell them what age you are or what your birth date is. You want to say, I'm legally allowed in this country to buy alcohol, you know, whatever the yeah. substance is that, that's legally allowed. So wh where are you at with the project? So um, are you, tell me, tell me a bit about your roadmap and where you're at. Yeah. So, um, so we have product in both the, app stores in terms of the consumer app so our first beta app is has gone live um it's definitely a beta at this stage we're still working very hard on it um but uh but it's functional and uh we're really pleased with with where we've got to with it um we have our developer tools uh, developer toolkits um portals for the developers to work with and things are all uh, in production as well um, we've uh, released our first commercial pro products, 
Um, we're having initial conversations with customers at the moment. So we hope we'll have first customers using this on board shortly. Definitely, we're at the stage where the customers we we are bringing on board and that we want to bring on board are people who, you know, they have an R&D team, they've got a development team, they're going to look at how this fits into the scheme of things and how they integrate it with stuff. We're kind of, we're kind of not at the stage where we're expecting people to say, you know, here's all of our users and go. Um, but we've been surprised by the degree of willingness for people to do that kind of thing. I think mostly because because the problem of fraud is exceptionally real to everyone who who you speak to. You know, everyone it it resonates with everybody, and and most of them have a thing that they need to deal with, and they need to deal with it now. Yeah. Um, and then most people have kind of gone. Well, there's nothing we can do about this, so we're just paying for it. You know, there are. Uh, I, we talked to someone in uh, in, a, in a in a bank a couple of weeks ago who you know they they are spending are spending over two billion pounds a year on fraud um and they're just absorbing that cost because it's essentially until now cheaper than dealing with the problem um and this this is the challenge of fraud it's just a thing that's in the background and it's it's a sort of pernicious extra cost for all of us. You know, it makes all our insurance more, exp- more expensive. It makes uh, it makes our power more expensive. It makes it makes the services that we buy from people more expensive. A bit's being siphoned off all the time. You know, the ten percent fraud is sort of the worst one. You know, just add a little extra bit onto this bill, and nobody's going to notice. But of course, it all adds up over time. It's how we end up in a situation we're in where fraud is. By GDP, fraud is the third largest economy on earth after China and the United States. That's mad. Isn't that And insane? again, you're thinking about stuff. People, rather than tackling the problem, they're building in the, the premium, the 10% the levy, whatever. They're building in the premium, absolutely. And, and is, the tackling of the problem is... tackle the project, problem. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, so make, it, audience, make it impossible up front. So your three audiences are people, developers, and businesses. Yes. Those are your three audiences that you're going yeah. for. Yeah. You're in beta... With, with which sections for all three sections or just for we're in, yeah the product is 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 in beta for all three groups brilliant um, and um, uh, and so that's up and up and running the the um, the core of our system is running on top of uh, Nears chain at the moment um, which I'm really pleased with actually um, we spent a lot of time kind of going through lots of different options but Near worked really well for us so. We're using them uh, for the current mainnet release, which is great, and um, uh, and we're um, working hard on adding new adding new features and products and, uh, and and elements to it, and moving things out of beta as quickly as we can. And in terms of fundraising, what are your plans? So our plans are to uh, to do an IDO in uh, Q1 next year. Okay, um, so soon. We're yeah, pretty soon. So we're currently um, talking to uh, investors ahead of the IDO um, and uh, working towards working towards that process. Brilliant. And um, if people want to find out more, get involved, etc., where should they go? Uh, with with the IDO or just with self? Both. 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 So um, our website is the best place to find more out about us. So joinself.com. Um, and uh, there are um, links in there to kind of groups and community and things that we're, that we're building up currently. So, um, uh, so yeah, both of those are, are good ways to connect with us. And probably the other really good way is to go download the Self app um, and connect directly with Self, and then you can speak to us through through Self. Brilliant. Well, I wish you every success. I, I really like the fact that you're coming from a place where your unthinking things, that dyslexic brain, that neurodiverse brain of yours is going, why do we drive like that? Why do we do that? Um, and then using technology to figure it out. So I think that's, that's really cool. Um, and um, and also even like the thing about people build in a premium for, for fraud rather than tackle, why not tackle the problem? Which is which is yeah. sounds so obvious when you say it out loud, you know, amazing. Yeah. Wish you every success with next year with your IDO and I should be following Thank your you. progress with interest. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Jane.